All right, welcome to this professional development opportunity regarding Maine mock election. My name is Jessica Graham. I'm a high school social studies teacher at Waterville Senior High School. And this year I'm serving as the Maine Department of Education Civics Teacher Leader Fellow. Um, and I'm really, really excited. I love this program and I'm especially excited because an expert on voting and elections and the mock election program is here to share some information with us today. So I'd like to welcome Maine Secretary of State, Shenna Bellows. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate and share resources and information with us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, today, we're gonna be discussing Maine's mock election program and how you as teachers can incorporate a vital educational opportunity into your curriculum to help promote democracy. Oh, wonderful. So why get involved with Maine's mock election program? It's an incredible way to be part of history and teach future voters how to engage with our democracy. It's an ideal way to incorporate Maine learning results uh, regarding civic uh, education and government into your classroom. Uh, it provides an opportunity uh, to teach students about constitutional principles and the democratic foundations of our federal, state, and local governments and institutions. By participating in the mock elections, students can learn how to exercise their own voting rights and responsibilities of participating in civic li life. And it can be an opportunity for students to be presented with an opportunity to analyze and evaluate public policies, uh, can provide insights into political power and how that is achieved and distributed and the types and purposes of different roles in government, especially in relation to the people uh, that the government governs. Uh, fun fact, in 2022, Maine was number one in the nation in voter turnout. Uh, more uh, Mainers per capita voted in the November 2022 general election uh, than any other state in the country. And one of the reasons I love Maine's mock election program is it's a great way to boost youth voter confidence and get young people excited about voting, which in turn will ensure that Maine is number one in the nation in voter participation for years to come. I'm so glad you talked about that. And as a high school teacher who has run several mock elections, anecdotally, I know that this program um, does build that confidence and comfort. I've I've definitely had students that um, told me, expressed to me that they hadn't really considered voting before. It just wasn't on their radar. And because we had a mock election at school and they felt like they knew what they were doing, they uh, registered to vote and participated in the election. So it it really does have real results. It's a great thing. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about some considerations you might want to think about if you are a teacher and you would like to implement this. Uh, first of all, I do want to say as a sort of disclaimer, you could certainly run a mock election just within your own classroom if that's what you have the capacity for, if, there, if it isn't something that you're ready to scale up and talk to other other folks in the school about, uh, but it is really pretty easy to run at a school-wide level. I've done it at multiple levels um, and encourage you to think about taking it on uh, for the whole school. So the first thing you want to think about is registering with the Secretary of State's office. You can go to their website and register, and that's going to get you in the loop for information and resources. And another two things that I would encourage you to think about early in the school year is, first of all, reaching out to your admin. So mock election happens in late October. Um, the date kind of changes from year to year, just like election day, uh, but it happens in late October. And so you're going to want to reach out to admin if you're thinking of this as a school-wide process and find a date for your school, either on or before that mock election day uh, that hasn't gotten filled in with field trips and assemblies and testing dates. Uh, so have that conversation as early in the school year as you can. And also in September, that's the best time really to reach out to your local municipal election staff. Uh, who's your town clerk? Who's your city clerk? If you want to partner with them, um, if you would like them to speak to your students or you'd like them to lend you voting booths, uh, both of which I've done in my schools, 
September is really uh, when you want to be doing that. So I know September for us in the classroom is absolutely the busiest time of the year, but your election staff, October is really going to be a super busy month for them. So I've always found that folks are more than willing to work with teachers in schools, but it's helpful to reach out in September when they have a little more space and they're not in the midst of the height of election season. And usually you'll find a super receptive audience. They love working with young people. Oops, sorry. So let's talk about how you get started if you want to participate in the statewide Maine mock election. Uh, first and foremost is registering to participate and assigning a contact person for your school for the Secretary of State's office. We, and that could be you, um, we will then send you a reporting form for your results as well as the um, form the ballot itself, the mock election ballot uh, that can be printable for as few or as many students will, that will be participating from your school. Then, of course, it's distributing the ballots. One person, one vote, of course, or one person, one ballot. Uh, and that can be a really, really exciting day, um, depending on the coordination with your municipalities and how you set that up. Uh, you'll want to collect those student ballots. So whether it's in ballot boxes um, that you make or create or borrow, um, and then tallying, creating a tally process for those ballots at the school-wide level. And then step number four, so it's easy as one, two, three, four, report your results. Uh, please, we, part of the reason you, we want you to participate in the statewide mock election program and reporting your results is because then we can include it in the statewide mock election totals. Uh, we are only expecting one email from each school, so definitely coordinating, uh, and if more than one grade or class is voting, coordinating among the various classes to aggregate those results before reporting to us. But one of the reasons that we love getting those results and then uh, reporting out statewide totals is we share that with reporters all over the state. And reporters in Maine have come to expect receiving the mock election results from the student votes from the Secretary of State office. Those results often get printed in the local newspaper or reported even on television. And so for students to see that their votes are part of the news can be pretty cool. Make them feel like their voices are heard and create a point of discussion in the classroom following the mock election. We then submit the main results to the national student mock election for inclusion in their tally. So schools don't need to sign up for the national mock election. We are the state representative reporting that out. Uh, and then that gets shared all across the country. So exciting. And there are a few more opportunities on the day of for high school students. I'll speak to that a little bit later when we're talking about implementing at the high school level. Um, but this whole process, as the secretary said, is often really exciting for kids of all ages. I've seen third graders, I've seen 12th graders get excited about this day. So as festive as you wanna make it, uh, it's a great thing. And I think the secretary is gonna share a little bit about the types of resources that the Secretary of State's office might have available for you. That's right. Once you register on behalf of your class or your school, uh, we'll provide you with three things. The mock election ballot that is uniform all across the state, the printable I voted today stickers. We think those are a lot of fun because again, it's a way for students to signal pride in voting, which builds that uh, engagement, civic engagement that we think is so important. And then also a video of the major election candidates speaking to students. So the names of people running in some of the statewide races may be somewhat familiar, but students may not actually have a lot of information about who those candidates are. So we invite each of the candidates to film a very short video about themselves so students can have something that is accessible and targeted just for the students from the candidates direct to them. Wonderful, and everyone loves stickers of all ages. <laughs> Um, at the elementary level, like I said, I've uh, run a mock election at multiple grade levels. Um, at the elementary level, I ran a mock election for a grade three through five school. Uh, it was wildly successful. It was a really fun day for everyone and actually a really fun month. 
that age group is so wonderful to work with. First of all, they're primed for imaginative play, even those upper elementary students. So I found that uh, role playing, incorporating role play really elevated the experience for many kids. I chose election day helpers. I had them, um, I printed out class lists. I had those helpers sign in their classmates as they arrived at the polls. Again, community partners are so important. If you can have a local official come in and speak to kids, that's great. But uh, what I have found almost every person I've contacted over the years is more than willing to do is bring some real voting booths to your school. And there is nothing like that authentic artifact for young people. They really became quite solemn and serious. When they were able to go behind the curtain in a real voting booth. Um, and actually, one community I worked in, even now so many of our polling places, they have the scanners that read ballots, but one community had an older uh, ballot box that they were that was still in City Hall and they were able to lend it to us for the day. So that made it feel, I think, a little more solemn for students to fold up their ballot and put it in a locked box. It was so important that everyone's vote was counted and safe. Um, one thing that had come up with younger students that I worked with and even my own daughter um, when she came home from elementary school years ago, that it's really important to explain that this is a practice run. Mock elections are an important way for us to practice the skill of voting. So sometimes young people may ask questions about how their vote counts. And it is exciting to hear those statewide tally tallies of mock elections, but I think it's important to clarify with students that um, their vote doesn't count as part of the uh, grown-up election quite yet, but I think it gives you an opportunity to build enthusiasm. You get to vote when you're 18, just like kids talk about, I get to drive when I'm 16. So explaining that this is practice, it doesn't, it doesn't actually influence the election, but what a wonderful opportunity to give voting a try. And in that vein, I think it's really helpful for young people uh, because like the secretary mentioned, uh, if you have third graders and fourth graders, not only will they likely not know a lot about the platforms or the candidates or the issues being voted on, but that might not even be the primary learning target for this experience, right? Like they might not need to fully understand who all the candidates are at that age, you really are teaching the process of voting. So in order to make that a little more concrete, uh, you can always work with admin, with other folks in your school to find something in your school community that the students will vote and it will affect the outcome of something that happens in your community. When I ran my elementary mock election, we uh, worked with food services and the students got to vote on what a lunch on an upcoming Friday would be. And I think the choices were taco and chicken burger. So that was a really concrete experience for them. They saw that they chose something and it had an effect on an outcome within their school community. And it led to some really creative campaign posters for tacos and chicken burgers. So it was a wonderful way to um, take something that is a little bit tricky, a little abstract to think about uh, and make it absolutely concrete and understandable for those younger kids. And at the elementary level, again, there's so many rich connections uh, to the broader curriculum, even outside of social studies, numerous picture books uh, about voting, about campaigning, about elections. If you subscribe to the DOE civics newsletter, I always do a um, civically minded book recommendation at the end. So you can find some recommendations there, uh, but you can reach out to your school librarian, to your uh, literacy, math coaches, and think about connections to reading, connections to literacy, connections to um, counting, to fractions, uh, et cetera. So, so many things that you can connect with at the elementary level. And you can extend the learning beyond the day of your mock election. You can really create a whole season in the fall around civic engagement, beginning with that national celebration of the Constitution in mid-September, so right after we've gotten all the kids settled into school routines, on September 17th, every year, it's National Constitution Day. There are so many uh, amazing 
ideas for lesson plans, resources through organizations like the National Constitution Center, the Bill of Rights Institute, iCivics. And if you so choose, this could be kind of a book ended, begin your civic learning season on September 17th, have activities and connections to other, uh, other cross curricular connections and round out with a fun mock election in late October. I love the idea of having a whole fall of civics education, starting with Constitution Day. One day that also might be a good opportunity for high school students is National Voter Registration Day. Now, I sometimes joke that every day is Registration Day in Maine because we have same day voter registration. So I always remind audiences that people can register to vote on Election Day and cast their ballot. But in some states around the country, there's a September deadline. So National Voter Registration Day is the national day where everywhere in the country you can register to vote. It's the last possible day for that. And that can be an opportunity to talk about voter registration, perhaps do a school-based voter registration drive, because in Maine, 16-year-olds are able to pre-register to vote, which prepares them for actually participating uh, when they're 17 in a primary, as long as they'll be 18 by the November election. Um, additionally, Part of allowing students to pre-register at age 16 is to create a conduit for poll workers. So working with your class, uh, contacting your municipal official to see if they have any needs on election day, students can um, participate during the day as volunteers or even counting out ab processing absentee ballots on a weekend ahead of election day or participating in the tabulation after the polls close on election night as volunteer poll workers under the jurisdiction of the municipal clerk. Um, I just, I can't say enough about connecting students to opportunities to volunteer, either counting absentee ballots or working on um, working at the polls on election day. That's something that I've really been trying to connect kids to over the last few years. And anecdotally, I've had so many students really almost any student who's participated in that, who I've spoken to about it, has reflected and felt like it was one of the most meaningful experiences of their academic career. Um, you know, they they get to sit with older community members that they wouldn't otherwise talk to, and they love they love talking to people in the community and learning from their experiences. They feel so invested in the democratic process when they do those things. And I have really had students, um, this is another reason I love the mock election process. I've had students who said, I'm not sure I want to volunteer on election day. I'm a little bit nervous about it because of course they haven't done it before, right? Um, but then they help run the mock election and then they feel a little bit more confident and a little more excited about reaching out to our um, city clerk and offering their hours to volunteer. So it's a it's a great uh, transition, the mock election to actually volunteering at the polls. And speaking of mock elections at the high school level, um, I, I think one of the things that's so wonderful about working with teenagers is you can really let them take on leadership roles. So at the elementary school level, of course, if you are teaching that age group, you're gonna probably be doing most of the organizing yourself. But I've always uh, tried to connect a group of student leaders to take the reins on running the mock election at the high school level. So incorporating them right from the beginning, communicating with admin, communicating with the city clerk, um, some ideas for groups to reach out to if you have an AP government class at your school, uh, those students tend to be quite interested in um, the political process and government. And also, uh, they're required to complete a um, civic engagement project. So this could be the basis of their civic engagement process. So if you could reach out to an AP government class, National Honor Society, Key Club, other groups that are service oriented at your school, and think about using those students as your uh, leader leadership group that can facilitate the mock election experience and really letting them make a lot of those communication steps, um, the publicizing of the event, et cetera. And speaking of publicizing it, uh, especially if you have students taking a leadership role, there are definitely kids at your school who are experts in using Canva and all sorts of other programs to make 
beautiful flyers, really catchy Instagram posts. And most student groups I, I've experienced have Instagram pages. Um, if there are school assemblies where they can stand up, all of that communication builds excitement for participation in mock election. And also um, one of the things I really love about it is it, it sort of demystifies um, it demystifies participation in the political process and normalizes that, you know, this is just part of our civic life together, that we vote. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, I would say positive peer pressure around civic engagement when you get kids running the mock election as much as they can. Uh, you'll still probably have to be that contact person submitting the vote counts to the Secretary of State's office, but really encourage those, those young people to take on leadership roles. Another thing that I do at the high school level, I often will have some, I will work with those student leaders and talk through um, what ballots look like. I do a lot of that educating of the student leaders, but then on the day that we have the mock election, I have um, a couple of tables and I have rotations of student leaders that will table so that as, as their peers come up to vote in the mock election, um, they will have information on registration. They'll have information on um, what the local ballot in their municipality actually looks like. Um, they could have information on other issues as well. Uh, so allowing that to be an opportunity where those student leaders can educate their peers about issues around the mock election in addition to uh, students participating in the mock election as well. Um, and one tip I have uh, over the years, many years of doing this, if you set up, if you are at the high school level and you set up your mock election near the cafeteria, you will get a lot more traffic than if you put it anywhere else. Often, um, I think a natural temptation for, in a lot of schools is let's put it in the library. That's a nice big space that uh, is you know, utilized by the whole school. You are going to get more traffic if you set up your mock election near the cafeteria. Um, it's It usually attracts a lot of students who might not otherwise venture out of their way into the library during the day. So that is that is my one pro tip, having done this for a number of years. So let's talk about ranked choice voting for a minute and why we love it, but why we don't use it for the mock election. So while the ballot itself will allow students to choose their first choice, second choice, third choice candidates, only the first round votes will be reported to the state. Now that actually mirrors the process that we follow for state elections. Uh, on election night, the municipalities are only counting the first round votes in every municipality, and that is what they're reporting to the state. Uh, and that is how we determine if somebody gets 50% plus one, that's the end of it. But for ranked choice voting tabulation, we then actually bring all of the ballots from all across the state to Augusta and do a ranked choice voting tabulation in person. We don't have the infrastructure. We just don't have the mm -hmm. staff uh, to do that for the mock election. Uh, that's why we don't have a ranked choice voting simulation for the statewide mock election results. You certainly could conduct one at your school, uh, particularly if in your school, none of the candidates exceed that 50% plus one threshold. So if you'd like to review ranked choice voting more closely, including what the process is, sample ballots, fact sheets, um, and other materials for your classroom, we have a ton of materials on the Secretary of State's website including an animated video with my predecessor, the former secretary, that has a delightful explanation of the ranked choice voting process uh, and other materials as well so that students can really study and learn that. As the secretary mentioned, I've used a lot of those resources when I've talked about ranked choice voting in the classroom. Um, that short animated video is one of the better explanations I have found of ranked choice voting for young people. Um, I will say, so I think it's great to, if, you, if you're in an election year and there is a race with more than two candidates, I actually think it's really, really wonderful to have um, an opportunity for students who are interested to try to work through that ranked choice process and see how it works. I've done that before 
um, again, with an AP government class where they, in addition to running the mock election, they had a project where they distributed um, samples of what the ranked choice ballot was going to look like for um, that year. I'm trying to remember the year. I can't remember now. Uh, it was a year when we had more than two people in a major race. Um, but what they did is they chose some classes and those teachers agreed to have their classes fill out the ranked choice ballots. They gave a little presentation about what it was. Um, and then we took a class and it, it, it did take, even with that small sample size, it did take an entire class to go through a couple rounds of hand counting ranked choice voting, which it makes it clear why that isn't um, something that we do for the entire state. But for those kids uh, who wanted that deeper dive into seeing how the process worked, it's definitely something that you can incorporate into that sort of season of civic learning in the fall. Um, and kids had a lot of fun. One of the pictures here on the slide is a couple of my students who um, they they were taking the mock election and their ranked choice voting tasks very seriously and wore um, very fancy clothes to school that day and then um, really got into the weeds with making sure that we were counting and double counting to check for any errors. Um, and we had to go through, I think, three rounds of ranked choice voting till we got to a 50% candidate. So it was a lot of fun and it's definitely worth investing the investing the time if you have a group of students who would like to uh, really see how that process works. Um, another uh, set of resources that I want to direct people towards, um, of course, elections are, I think, uh, this is my optimistic spin on election season, I think it's a wonderful time for those of us in the classroom to really focus on teaching norms of civil discourse that might not be always what our young people, unfortunately, are seeing um, out in the wider world, but what better place to think about the world that we want to see than in classrooms. So the Department of Education, the main Department of Education has over the last, especially the last um, four years, really compiled a, a huge range of resources about how to teach and practice civil discourse, especially civil discourse around contentious topics, um, including elections. So I would direct folks to head to the Depart main Department of Education website where you'll find uh, videos, you'll find interviews, links to um, other organizations that work on this issue of promoting civil discourse. But I always tell my students, this is the best time to practice uh, talking to other people that you know you might not disagree with in a humane way, right? Like this is this is where we build those skills. So um, lots and lots of resources to support teachers who want to incorporate uh, mock election or other, other issues around civic engagement and want to build up their toolbox for how to engage kids who might be coming from different places in a really productive and healthy and community-minded way. And I also would love to encourage folks to sign up for the Maine Department of Education weekly civics newsletter, Civically Minded. I'm currently the person putting those resources together, so it will keep you informed about some happenings at the Department of Education, professional development opportunities. Um, I also try to include uh, links to great resources from other organizations, opportunities for students to be involved, um, and always a book recommendation for uh, often, often picture books. I love, my favorite part of working with young people is reading social studies oriented picture books. So lots of resources for teachers of all grade levels in that weekly newsletter. So I encourage folks to subscribe to that. And also thank you so much, Secretary Bellows for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Jessica, for putting together this awesome presentation. I can't wait to have more schools sign up for mock elections. Just email our office. Please reach out. We're here to help. Awesome. Thank you so much.